Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mamluks podcast. My name is Sim. Along with me are my co hosts, Irtiza and Mort. How y'all doing this evening? Let's give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Halfardeen.com is a place you go for the private matrimonial experience. Go to halfardeen.com and set up and set up your profile in as little as five minutes. Wahidinvest.com is a place you go for halal investing. Go to wahidinvest.com and set up your profile so that you can earn some halal income. And finally, mywasia.com is the place you want to be at for setting up a Sharia compliant will. Myosia.com was set up by Chef Joe Bradford for the purposes of creating a will that is also compliant with the U.S. Um, laws. All right. Uh, and make sure you check us out on patreon.com backslash the Mad Mom Lukes. We are indebted to all the support of all the patrons that have been continuing to support us over the past few months since we set it up. But we are still in need of your support. Please help us out so that we can deliver you the quality that you so deserve. We have a wonderful panel for you this evening, and I will go ahead and get started with uh, starting off introducing Sheikh Yusuf Rios, who is uh, our very own Mahin Islam's personal Sheikh. Um, that's the only way I could describe him, I guess. Um, um, Mahin uh, just talks to the world of, of Sheikh Yusuf, and, and we have the a tremendous amount of respect for Sheikh Yusuf, and uh, we, we we're so delighted that he can join us for this conversation. And we also have um, activist uh, Hazel Gomez. Sorry, Hazel, I have the wrong name played on you. This this stuff always happens because of uh, the way the Zoom operates, and I'll fix that in a second. But uh, Hazel, if for longtime listeners who uh, are aware of our past episodes she is the wife of mark crane and that is the project that was a uh, i dream of detroit that happened that, that happens in uh, the detroit suburbs or is that detroit detroit um uh, hazel detroit detroit proper yeah like so she's a community organizer and activist well known in in our community at least in in uh, practicing brothers and sisters people who are engaged with uh, a lot of uh activities related to spreading the dean and improving our communities for the better and uh hey, Sim. yes uh just real quick sorry before you get yes, started sir. the names are all mixed up a little bit yeah yeah you got okay you got it yeah, okay yeah, i'm, I'm sure gonna take care that. of that don't worry so okay, um, cool. yeah um the purpose of of the mad mom looks has always been to engage conversations so that we can learn better from each other what we despise some of the vitriol that happens online and sometimes there's a lot of confusion in terms of uh, just the way uh, communication is conducted on social media and there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that's essentially lost in translation and what we, what we want to do is that we were having a, a sort of discussion over the weekend over some controversial uh, messages that happened with the brother and uh, and uh, Hazel had brought it to attention on her social media account, and we want to uh, surround. It, it was an interesting dichotomy for me, at least, because I know the brother, and I saw uh, something that was, sh you know, uh, him getting kind of in trouble uh, online, and I I felt like, you know what, this is uh, an excellent discussion to have, and I reached out to my wife, Noreen, who knows H Hazel, and I said, hey, let's let's start up a conversation, uh, and uh, as well, uh, Mahin also knows Sheikh Yusuf as well, so this is this was a wonderful way for us to bring some conversation together uh, on this, and I think um, we're all brothers and, and sisters, so there, there's, there's never any animosity or hatred in our hearts, especially for something so mild, but we want to make sure that we have a productive conversation regarding this and so i'm going to go ahead and show the the, the viewers the 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 tweet or sorry not the tweet the facebook post that hazel had put up and i hid the names that people talked about underneath so um just for anonymity sake and uh let's just go ahead and talk about it and so here's a tweet it says man some of these sisters on twitter are so freaking fine I found so many Latina convert converts. I'm starting to reconsider my resolve to not get a second wife. I know lawyer gays, but it just creeps up sometimes on the TL. 
Oh, that's the, the Twitter stream, I guess. Um, the low, <clears throat> the low T O. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, I did this tweet, um, this message of Hazel's went halfway around the world in, in a matter of an hour. And, you know, a lot of people were buzzing around it because the brother is actually, you know, a well-known brother in terms of a practicing brother. And he, and he, it was a message that, uh, he, he had sent to some private, uh, on his private Facebook uh, page and it was just meant to be among the brothers, but, um, w we, it got out and Sheikh Yusuf uh, brought it to uh, uh, Hazel's attention and we want to talk about it a little bit and try to understand what um, what this is all about and what was your your first uh, inclination when you saw that that message let's just start out start off with you you mean like the actual tweet itself yeah would you have made um, it, would you have made, message, yeah. yeah would you have made a, a, a statement like that online um I don't think I would have. I mean, just because, I mean, I think it's appropriate online. Yeah. But you might but have said I it think in of the actual tweet. And, and I'm going to be honest, I di it didn't really phase me much. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of people talk about women of different ethnicities and be like, hey, I want that kind of wife or I want this kind of wife or I want that kind of wife. So for me, I mean, as a man, it didn't really I mean, I didn't think too much about it. You know, I'm like, oh, well, it is what it is. Right. The guy just tweeted out his opinion. All right, or whatever. And then um, I was actually, I, it came to my attention because I think one of the brothers just posted out like saying, hey, people are, are talking about this. So what do you think about it? And I don't know. It just didn't, I didn't think about it too much, to be honest. I mean, well, I didn't really have an initial reaction, if that's what you're asking. Did you think it was appropriate? I don't know. I mean, I mean, it, it, mildly in some ways in some ways yes some ways no i mean because the thing is like you know he he's joking right i mean I, that's how i took it and when i looked at it you know i mean obviously a man who's married is going to post that on, on his facebook or twitter there's got to be some humor with that right yeah. but i can see how you know if you have a following like you wouldn't want to put that kind of message out there right even if you're joking about that that you know certain jokes are re meant for certain circles right like you're not you know, I mean, I, I mean, I get it between friends. Sometimes people joke a little bit here and there, but to put that out there in the public and to seem like, you know, I'm just looking at, I'm looking at these girls because I just want to take a second wife. I, I wouldn't personally do that. Erza, what about you? Hmm? Erza, uh, what were your uh, thoughts when you saw that? Well, you know, I mean, there's two parts, right? People are offended. So obviously if people are offended, then at least to some people it was offensive, right? So you can't really tell people what they can and can't be offended for. I get that. But if the brother had it on a private setting or on his page, I mean, we, we have to be honest, you know, whatever time we're living in and uh, whether you're talking amongst brothers or sisters are talking about sisters or it's a Lazar graduates or Medina graduates or Umul Qura graduates, people say things and make, and even comments that might be a little inappropriate. Now, again, the issue is here. It was offensive to some people. So that has to be addressed, but the comment by itself, I'm 39. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I didn't see the comment was that offensive either. Uh, I, I get why exotification is a problem. I get why treating Latinas inappropriately is a problem. And before Latinas, this happened to black sisters. And before them, it's happened to white sisters because people have been uh, treating uh, Latina sisters wrong. And before that, black sister and, and white sisters. I mean, I've I'm Daisy, okay. I'm, I'm I was born and raised in Texas, but originally my parents are from Kashmir. We're, we're there from Pakistan, and from time I was a child, I know people marrying white reverts for visas and black sisters for visas. And you know, back then you could get the citizenship in two years or three years, and then they drop them. They maybe had a wife back in Pakistan or India or Bangladesh, and this is a problem. This is horrible. This is horrible. Okay. So, but but the joke is a joke or as a comment, and especially if it was meant for his own Facebook. Uh, and now maybe there's a backstory. Maybe Sheikh Yusuf and that brother have a problem, or maybe they know each other. Maybe there's a context, and Sheikh Yusuf could explain the context. Yeah. But just as one standalone comment, to be outraged over it, I didn't see it. And, and again, I'd be happy for Sheikh Yusuf to educate us or the sister Hazel. Um, 
to educate us. Maybe there's something deeper. Maybe we're missing it. Maybe it is deeply offensive and we should also be offended. But again, I didn't see it that way. I did not. So, yeah. Um, uh, so let's just start off with um, Sheikh Rios and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on to Hazel. Uh, so to provide some of the, the context behind why, you know, that would be so offensive. Um, actually, I wanted to pass off to Hazel. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. because because in ha- in Hazel's tweet or message, it said the exotification. So it wasn't the actual, you know, maybe Hazel would have been different if he found uh, Pakistani women. Uh, would that have been fine if it wasn't the ethnicity that he was alluding to, but he, rather he just talked about a Pakistani or some other, or maybe white woman or, or, or any other ethnicity? Was it particularly because of the Latina related comment? Well, first off, um, assalamu alaikum and thank you for inviting me on the show today. Um, this, this concept of fetishizing and exotifying women, um, well, first off, we're Muslim. And as Muslim women, this is something that constantly happens with Muslim women being covered and non-Muslim men saying, oh, um, Muslim women are so exotic because they cover and it's mysterious and I'm wondering what's under there, right? So we get that from that angle. And then from an ethnic angle, we get it from Desi men or Arab men or you know men from predominantly Muslim majority countries. And it is the internalized white gaze that I'm hearing on this panel. Um, and so even though it, the, the question that was asked was that, the question asked was that, um, is it a problem for him to have shared it on social media? The answer is yes. This is not something that even should be joked about. Just like we don't make jokes on racism, we also should not make jokes about women, whether it's in private or in public. Um, well, first off, we're Muslim and we need to watch our thoughts because our thoughts can turn into actions. And so this thought was shared on social media for an action to take on a second wife who happens to be Latina. Um, and so, uh, you know, the brother mentioned that this is the exotification of, of just Latina women actually many convert women that experience it pakistani women also experience it from other from other ethnic backgrounds because of the authentication of being muslim right uh, so either way as muslim women we get uh, fetishized from non-muslim men and then to also be fetishized within the muslim community from muslim majority cultures is also really frustrating so, uh, can you define fetish fetishization uh, for us, so that we we understand that that term better? And because I could say, hey, you know, I've told my wife, I'm like, hey, I found uh, I find Brazilian woman beautiful, and 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 she knows that, and she's she's perfectly secure in in our marriage, with you know, uh, and am I have I fetishized uh, Brazilian woman in that sense? Um, so, so, so can you help us understand that a little bit better? Sure. So then my question to you would be, is it a preference or is it looking at Brazilian women based on what you're seeing in the media? Is it your daily interactions with them? Have you grown up with Brazilian women that you have a complete understanding that goes beyond the appearance and beyond the look, beyond the carnaval, beyond, beyond the carnaval look, beyond, um, beyond what you see in music videos? You know. Uh, so that's one. And then two is Muslims. Muslims very much request. Oh, I, I think Sheikh Yusuf. I think you gotta mute your mic from when I think we're hearing some background noise right there. And then the the other notion is very much Muslims in the West internalizing the white gaze towards other groups of people. And I'll define white gaze. The white gaze is trapping people of color in the white imagination. So the white gaze is trapping people of color in the white imagination, which is what we do on a daily basis. If you look at our shows, you look at Full House, you look at Friends, for example, like they're in New York and they now one Puerto Rican on that show, right? So that is an example of, of the white gaze. And unfortunately, a lot of Muslims in the West have internalized that. No, what does that mean? Does that mean like they're attracted to like white people? Is that what they like? They feel like white people are. Well, I, I I don't understand what the white gaze is. The white gaze means that people of color, us, we are we are being trapped 
in the white imagination of, of the world, right? So it's a white, it's a hierarchy of white supremacy. So we live our, so the exotifying Muslim women being told, oh, Muslim women are so mysterious because they completely cover. That's an example of the white gaze. So Sim, if I can say something on this, just, just to get it clear on the record, just a, so we said the tweet that the brother had is wrong, just like racism is wrong. I don't know if we were comparing it or, and then I, I didn't get that. So Sim, for Sim to say that Brazilian women are beautiful, he, that's problematic because first he should know deeper things about them before he could say that. I, I, I genuinely am trying to understand. I did not understand that. So when we have a preference towards a particular group of people, the question is, is that preference over st because of stereotypes? Or is that preference based on familiarity? So I'll give you an mm -hmm. example. When I was looking to get married and I ended up marrying my husband, I had a sister ask me, oh, I didn't know that you were into black guys. And I was really taken aback by that comment. And I said, honestly, our backgrounds are pretty much identical. He just happens to be African-American and I'm Latina and his ethnic background didn't play much of a factor. We just had this familiarity concept, right? Um, whereas I had other brothers who were of Indo-Pak background say very disturbing and disgusting things to me or ask of me because I was Latina that they would have never had the goal to say to someone else probably of their own background because there was all these assumptions that you are Latina so you must do or know of XYZ and not taking me for who I am as an individual. All right. So, so, so two points real quick. I'm just curious about this. I'm trying to put this all in the context. So let's say we, we didn't put an agenda. I mean, an identity on it. Let's say it wasn't Latina or Pakistani or whatever. Let's say a guy likes, you know, you know, in this case, let's say light skinned women, with blonde hair. That's, just, that, that's what he's attracted to. You know, in marriage, I'm not saying it's the only thing, but when people get married, they have to be attracted to one another. So if he goes, hey, you know what? I love women from Scandinavia because, you know, that's typically how they look. Right. I mean, it's not like it's, um, you know, something kind of hidden. I'm sure there are differences. And he probably doesn't know the culture or where it comes from. I, I, to me, I don't I don't see how that would be fetishizing it. It's more of like he knows what he's attracted to. And so he's saying it. And vice versa, like a woman, I'm sure there are many women when they're getting married. They also have stereotypes about men. For example, they might say, you know, um, you know, uh, Pakistani men may be timid or, you know, white men may be less cultural or, you know, there's so many stereotypes that are out there. I think women do the exact same thing. And that's, that's part of maybe cultural ignorance. But uh, to say it's fetishizing and I'm, I'm still trying to draw that that parallel. I think that, you know, if, he, if he's saying, uh, you know, oh, I like this, this Latina girl is, you know, because, ex I, you know, I saw a J-Lo video, you know, and all, all Latino girls are like that. I could say, okay, well, he probably thinks that all Latino girls are like that, and that's not true. I would say, hey, that's a problem. But, you know, maybe he likes the way they look, you know, or maybe he thinks that they have a certain feature that he likes about them, you know. And, and I get now, and, and to be honest, I get are you, the main can, thing. Can, hmm. can, can you hear me or not? Because yes, I, I we can hear you. Sure. We, we're good. We can hear you. Do, do you I, want to speak I, right now? I think that, I think that, uh, the danger that we're facing in the Muslim community. Uh, I think that the, da the danger that we're facing in the Muslim community is the concept of relativizing situations. So, so here in this situation, this becomes the issue of personal opinion. It becomes the issue, well, you know, I have a right within my circle to just vocalize personal opinion. And so then um, there's truth to that, but then there's also a lot that's lacking. One is like, there's a lot of other conversations that went into that, whether it was in the comments or whether it was even in the private side, because there was some back and forth that, uh, I ended up actually blocking the brother and, and another brother along with that. Uh, and the reason why is because there's a level of clarity that we have to maintain. That the level of clarity that we have to maintain is that if we were playing in the power dynamics, meaning in the workplace, then the Me Too movement would just eat you up. You know, in the sense that, or the sexual harassment, uh, 
the sexual harassment principal will come in and that will be investigated. And so in the workplace, there's a certain decorum that's demanded from the professional community. And so there's certain things that we know and what environment we say what we want to say because of the degree of safety that we may feel, whatever. That's completely independent to the issue of responsibility that we have as Muslims or the, or the character set that we work out of. Uh, and so the, the brother also, he had mentioned some things like he, that I was trying to like stream virtual, whatever. Because he, he actually went and picked some statements from women, whoever they were, some he tried to say they, they were Latino sisters. It was like, you're not going to address the fetishization of men, are you? You know, let's see if you address this. And see, that's where we start relativizing struggles. Let's not deal with what's in the mind of an individual and then try to justify that on a cultural basis. Let's deal with the ground reality. What's the situation, the real life, real life lived experiences of Latino sisters? Let's not talk about, uh, let's, not, let's not try to trivialize that particular dynamic and say, well, why not all women, black women, European American women? Because first of all, we, first of all, we're talking about a specific situation. We're talking about the case of Latina women. If we wanna have another higher level dialogue about the case of women or the case of other women from other groups, that's in addition to, but that's not going to trump the reality of the conversation. Reality of the conversation is that within that same week, you know, some of the imams, we got like about seven to 10 calls on this type of stuff on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the problematic relationships that these sisters are having in the community. So, so that, that's the, so that's the, that's part of the problem that we're talking. You, you brothers, I understand where you're coming from, but you're talking on the intellectual level. What you have done is you have removed the human being from the picture. You can't, you can't uh, dehumanize a person, or you can't relativize the experience of an individual. If sisters are coming to the community and saying we're experiencing X, Y, and Z, then there's a certain responsibility that we have to listen to say what is going on. Not, well, you know, well, that's how you're interpreting it. You can't, inter you can't, tr you can't dismiss someone's suffering in the name of, well, that's how they perceived it in the name of, well, it's perception. That's where we start relativizing truth. Sure, so if we get into that type of dynamic, everybody's struggle will be relativized. So that's the first thing. Begin from the human being. What are the human beings going through? The second point is this. In anthropology, we have a principle. In anthropology, there were some studies that were done. Axes were put at the border of an Amazonian community, a community in Amazon, in the Amazon. And so that community, that technology was introduced into it, and it completely transformed their culture. The axe became a tool for war. The axe became a tool for cutting down the, uh, the trees. The axe became currency it became the means by which the community began to internally fight each other so we you know at a higher level we have to understand what's 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 the case here but if it was the case here, the case here is that culture is being generated so there there's a culture of acceptability in specific when it comes to the latino sisters that you can deal with them in a specific way these sisters are not sisters that are coming into Islam with vast supports, right? And that's the thing that you got to realize is that the impact that this is having in the real world with real people, not in someone's psychology or the imagination only, but there's real impact of what the Muslim community is accepting as acceptable behavior for Latina sisters, whether it's imams, because also we have confronted imams that justify certain behaviors towards Latina sisters. Again, that's part of a bigger conversation, but we're yeah. not addressing this situation with everybody. We're addressing specifically the plight of Latino sisters. And what we're saying as a Latino community, what we're saying as a Latino community is, look, we understand the plight of our sisters. We, we understand because they're educating us, not because we're superimposing. They're the, they're the voices. They're the ones that are coming and educating. We're going through A, B, and C. That's the first thing. 
they're speaking for themselves. And so what we're telling the community is like, no, you guys have to change that culture. You can't, you, we're not going to allow you to introduce a culture which is just okay to trivialize the marriage reality. You know, that's not the language of rights and responsibility. That's the language first of sexualization, right? And then, you know, I'll consider as a second wife. And, and I asked the brothers a, a number of times, I said, would you accept that for your wife online, for your daughter, for your mother, for your cousin, for your aunt? No one had the ability to directly answer that question. It was constantly veered in a different way. You know, it, it, no one addressed that specifically. And I was saying, you have to understand that we're trying to rebuild the community in Islam. If we wanted to, if we wanted to, uh, if, we, if, if, if we wanted to have the big pun concept, you know what I'm saying, where everybody's the player on the block, you know, I'm gonna see how many women I can mack, then we would have stayed outside of Islam. You know what I'm saying? And so there's certain things you gotta understand that there's different sisters from different backgrounds and different cultural experiences. All the sisters that are coming in may not be the club type of, type of sister. They may not be the street hip hop type of sister. They may not be the party type of sister. You have some sisters which are extremely religious in their background. You have some sisters which are, are dreamy about Islam. They're expecting an ideal world. In other words, what is the presentation that we're giving to them about Muslim men and marriage? Right. And that's that's what the bottom line is. That's what comes. That's what what the issue comes back down to that. We're giving a very bad practice. As far as how we deal with the Latino sisters, we're giving them a very bad understanding of what Islam is. So brothers are not dealing with the phone calls about sisters wanting to leave the deen after the marriage goes Ari or she figures out that she's been used and she she figures out that she's the third person or she's the, the side chick or whatever. You know, that's a case that I just finished dealing with. And then the sister sends me pictures about how the brother cheated on it. They're not dealing with that. You know, they're not dealing with the issues of, of being used and abused from behind the scenes. So that's why I say, yeah, we can talk about a person's right to an opinion. Or we could talk about a person just joking. But we, this is the problem with the Muslim community. I had a brother make tech fear of me. Then when I called him on it, he said, oh, I'm just joking with my friends. So the speech for the Muslim community has become meaningless. We say whatever, and then it has no it has no grounding. Okay. And then what we do is we say we, we and I, I, you know I pull back after this point. What we do is we say, well, it's, it's my right to say this, or I was joking. But it's not just the issue of offensiveness. We're not just talking about political correctness. We're not just talking about emotion. We're talking actual practices of abuse, and that fits in to a general culture. And what we're saying is that, no, chill right there. Before you start to generate that culture, you need to understand what's going on on the ground right now in real time with human beings, how this is widespread. It fits into a bigger phenomenon. That's the that's the whole purpose of addressing that. You know, I wanted to mention a quick point um, for Sheikh Yusuf mentioned, is that his examples of, of, of various types of people that come into Islam, right? So I'll share very quickly um, my own personal story, very brief. Um, when I was looking to get married and the different communities of men that uh, came to me from different backgrounds, the, there was this assumption that because I was Puerto Rican and Mexican, that I was a, there was an assumption that I was a club hopper, an assumption that I had a secret child, an assumption, um, all these uh, very dunya, dunya, um, dunya assumptions, as if my family, because they were not Muslim, as if they were completely jah from the jahiliya, right? Not, not taking me for who I was being raised in a very traditional, very strict Puerto Rican family. And it was very dehumanizing for my own family to meet some of these men. And my grandmother, you know, making comments like, wow, he just thinks you're the seconds on a plate. Uh, he's completely disrespecting us and respecting you as a woman. I hope that you don't plan on moving forward with this, right? And then when I would mention my family's comments on him or his family, um, uh, the comments would be like, well, your family's not even Muslim. They don't really matter. Um, and so to, it this gave a very bad taste of Islam to my, uh, to my family. I had a Muslim brother. I'm sorry. Uh, and how old are these guys? 
these guys were in their mid 20s before I got, I mean, I got married at 26. So I was looking, I think the oldest was maybe like 35. <laughs> um, so between like, you know, 25 and 35. And that it was very disheartening, you know, and to, and to even have a, a brother's father look me dead in the eye and say, you know, we don't marry Mexicans, they mow our lawns, right? Like this is the stereotypes that have been within various Muslim majority communities and cultures um, because there's no interaction with Latinos, right? And so I just really wanted to, to, to say that point that um, we all come from different backgrounds yeah. and it's important to get to know the individual for who they are and not have this assumption that all Latinas are XYZ, all black women are XYZ, you know, right. all Desi women are XYZ. Well, well, one of the issues that, that comes up is that many of us are, <clears throat> We we don't know what's actually happening with whether whether it's Latino convert sisters right, or any right, convert right, right. sisters because yeah. that that's one of the things that is happening in in social media that a lot of or whether it's social media or a community leader uh, such as Sheikh Yusuf who gets uh, the fun uh, get all gets all these complaints kind of funneled directly to him and. When I saw that, I understood where Sheikh Yusuf was coming from. I, I knew, like, okay, he must have had some direct engagement with sisters who have been suffering. But he conflated that to some similar language that may have been coming from a brother who, from everyone who knows him, no, is, is, is no, a very there wasn't practicing a brother. There no, was, no, I'm not there saying. I'm not a saying. I, yeah, go ahead. I told I told the brother there was no conflation there. We draw on the line. We're yeah. saying we're not going to allow you to do that. That's what we're saying. There's no conflation here. We're saying that, no, the Latino imams and the Latino leaders, whether it's Hazel or other, we're not going to allow that from the Muslim community. We're drawing the line. We're not going to generate that culture because we're building community. The Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the things that he did was he built a security system for the early converts. That was manifested most clearly in the Brotherhood Pact, by the time they got to uh, Medina, but you also see in the relationships that the Muslims had early on in Mecca. And eventually that became the basis for the transformation of the community. It went from interpersonal relationship that was supportive, that were affirmative and healthy, spiritually, materially, towards family being reconstructed. This is the problem that we're having. We have two different Dawah approaches here. We have an Americanized population that doesn't really understand the realities of American culture. We have a first generation Muslim culture which doesn't understand the system because there's not enough generations behind you to really understand how the system works. And Hazel was trying to explain that to you that there's certain values that we're taking on in the community which are really not Islamic values. And so even, even the brother tried to compare himself he said well what are you going to say if the sahaba what the sahaba build the ummah the sahaba built the ummah don't compare ourselves to the sahaba we're not building the ummah so the so the the, the line that's being drawn is, is saying that there needs to be a, a certain as a community what are we doing bottom line what are we doing to support converts is the community there when these sisters take shahada and their families kick them out are they providing the security blanket when they took the shahada because that's what a lot of these sisters experience is the community there after the fact when the sister left her culture, when she left her food, her background, when she turned her back on her family because the Muslim community told her to? Is the community there to pick her, 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 her up when she falls? Is the community there to support her when the community told her, well, that, you know, Islam says that half of your deen is married. You need to be married. Real life situation. And then the marriage becomes abusive. Is the community there to pick, it, uh, pick that sister up? So that's where that's where we go from a neoliberal approach to community responsibility. It's not just the issue of my person expressing myself. It becomes the issue of what, what, what's the responsibility that we have in the reconstruction of the community. We're talking about rebuilding a community, a community that decided to come into Islam and they're leaving, they're leaving certain realities that they understood. They're leaving a security system, a safety system to confront Muslims that would just want to assert their individual opinions and desires and this and that, they understand the gravity. We're talking about rebuilding a community on the basis of Islam, trying to bring people into the deen so that they stay committed to the deen. 
not that their interpersonal experiences with the Muslims become such that it becomes a rationale and a reason, whether it's an emotional reason, an intellectual reason, a physical reason, whatever, it be, to leave the deen. And that's yeah. what I think that we're missing in this in this uh, in this reality that two different platforms. We're we're trying to build the community, and we're trying to service the people. And in this case, this specific, the Latina sisters because they're bringing these problems, and we're saying to the Muslim community, like, get your act together, y'all. Like, we we're in the process of trying to make sure that shahadas remain and people grow. This is not an issue of me just expressing what. Oh, I'm joking and this and that. That, it doesn't work like that, you know. The, 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 what is the what is the responsibility that we have to the community? And that that right. becomes the bottom line. Do we have one or not? So, so I think I think there's two main things that I'm seeing from here. The, there's one comment that's made, and then there's a context in which it's understood, and then there's a the, and I think it's understood in the context of the reality that 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 um, in this specific case, Latina people or Latino women are facing. And perhaps that brother made that comment, not realizing what's happening on the ground. And you're linking this comment directly in terms of effect on, on the Muslim community. Meaning, you're, you, what, I don't think people understood this point, that you, this comment, is, I, from my, the way I understand it, is that you're saying it's shaping a mindset that's leading to the abuse mm-hmm. of convert Muslims. Who are coming in to get married and it's to, legitimizing to, it, legitimizing right. it. So, so I, I think, see, and I, and I think that's where people not by I, itself is it's not by itself. Right. Not no, I'm, itself. I think it's part of the larger problem. That's it's, this is just a symptom right. of the larger problem. I, I can understand that. Part. Right. So. So, I mean, because one thing I did read about your tweet was that you're saying, hey, I'm not going to tolerate, you know, this happening because. Uh, Latino sisters are getting tired of being abused and tossed out when they get married and abused and then, you know, tossed away. And for me, I, I think every person on this panel can say unequivocally that any man that's getting married to a woman, no matter what background she is, Muslim, even non-Muslim, you don't abuse a woman and just use a woman to get married and get out, right? I mean, that's never okay for anybody. I don't think anyone here will sign but up for that. That's the bigger, pic- that's the bigger picture. Now we're going outside... We're, we're, we're talking about a bigger phenomenon, but the reality is that the Muslim community is allowing that. No, the Muslim I, I get that. I get that. And is what, allowing that. Right. So what I'm trying to say, though, is that I think here's the thing. This is how I'm going to look at it. If the brother one has a preference, that's one thing. All right. But if that preference is, is leading to if he's only having a preference because he's being greedy and he doesn't have a commitment to actually wanting to. Uh, treat that person as a spouse, as a real spouse, Islamically, then it's a problem. And I think that's the problem we should be addressing. For me, look, I, I come from a mixed background. Many other people who are listening. What's the mixed- problem? What's the problem that we should be addressing? The problem is that people, if they're if they're making claims about getting married and saying this stuff and that stuff, it should be a, a genuine case of marriage, not not some. Not, I'm, I'm saying they shouldn't just be joking about getting married. We no, no one ever that, jokes. But that's about- the issue. But this is the issue that marriage is true. This is another issue that can be generalized. You raise an important point. Marriage has become so trivialized in the Muslim community that we're facing divorce on a rampant level. There's another issue, too. Polygamy is allowable in Islam, right? Uh, polygamy, polygamy is allowable in Islam. You have some legal implications, but we also have internal issues. Like, let's, let's be honest. In the indo pac the Southeast Asian community, customarily, is, is polygamy alive, allowed? No. Generally, culturally, it's looked down upon. It's looked down upon. And so, so when we look at these situations, like when we, when we interpret things from the side of people's cultural realities and understanding their first generation, it doesn't make any sense, that type of joking, right? That type of joking. When you know in your community that that's not, polygamy is not acceptable. So then what yeah, becomes but the I'll point? Be honest, Shaykh, what becomes the point? But culturally, you don't get married to, uh, in, in, in indo pac culture, you don't get married to an African-American either in, in indo pac right? culture. But, but we're not talking, we're not talking yeah. about, we're not talking about that. We're talking specifically, in this case, the comment in the context of how it's said and who is, the, who is saying it, right? Because that, unfortunately, it becomes that. And, and I don't like personalizing issues so much because I already made the point to the brother. It's not yeah. only that. There was a, a line of traffic of comments that were made, right? There was a brother who who sent me who sent me a, a, a response 
from uh, from the from Abu Dhabi, and he says, you know, we will not negotiate with terrorists, trying to make it like the issue is a feminist type of thing, and and so so we're left like what is you know we're left with what is our what is our culture and our etiquette as Muslims, you know what what you know what do we want to see for our daughters and ourselves? It's not that we don't look Allah created beauty. It's not that there's no attraction there. We're, we're not denying that there's beauty and there's attraction. This, that. Good. We're talking I'm glad about you said that. A lot of people are like, yo, they're saying, hey, are you getting down on this brother because he finds some women attractive? And I think a lot of people are wondering that right now. They're saying, hey, is he coming down because, you know, this man saw a Latina woman attractive and maybe Sheikh Yusuf got offended that he found Latina women attractive? I think a lot of people are thinking that. And I'm glad that you said that it's not just about attraction because that's a human thing. Men are attracted to women. I think you're hitting on the bigger issue is that, well, what do you do? I mean, marriage is more than just attraction. Bro, we, 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 we have accepted a culture on the Internet where brothers are trolling other people's wives. Brothers are trolling women. You know, we, 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 you know, we got to realize that where we're at right now, what we have accepted among ourselves, we are actually becoming predatorial. And I'm not saying that to that brother. It's like, look at that implication. Imagine your, your teenage daughter is online. She happens to be the, the sister that... Uh, puts on the makeup and shows herself. And then you have this brother trolling and hitting on her DM or her inbox. And the sisters are telling us that. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't have a problem with the community finding spouses online because we're not doing a good job. But let's be responsible. If we're going to be social on social media, let's be social. You know, yeah, let's I, I think with the biggest thing is that people somehow think that when they're on social media, the pen is lifted from them. That right. They're not going to be held accountable exactly. for what exactly. they're saying and doing. Oh, it's just trolling. I'm not going to be held accountable for my words. And I think that's a, that's a big problem in general with social media. I mean, I know that's overgeneralizing what we're talking about here, but it happens all over. I mean, you mentioned someone made takfir of you and then claimed it's a joke. I don't care if you make it online or in a tweet or whatever. You know, takfir is no joke, right? Nobody does that. You know, you know about the hadith that if someone makes takfir of someone else, one of them becomes a, a kafir for sure, right? So, I mean, that's no joke about that. And I think that's absolutely an, another good point that, you know, people are unfortunately saying these words without, um, you know, understanding that you can help be held accountable in al-akhirah for that. Like literally in al-akhirah, you can be held accountable for what you say and do online. Um, and and the I problem, think the, the problem with that is that let me let me cut you off for a second. The problem with that is that that's fine. What somebody's punishment or reward is in the akhirah that's between them and Allah. I'm not so much concerned with that because every Muslim has to have a personal conscience. I'm more concerned with the ramifications that people have in the dunya with people on the ground with real human beings. Like, where is that going? You know, what are we doing as a Muslim community? And I'm not coming off from the angle of virtue. I'm saying that we should be supporting each other in growth and development. And so the responsibility that we have to each other, that's what I keep coming back, to bring each other up to a higher level where, our, where people feel safe in our community. That's what I'm talking about. It's like... You know, I'm not talking about being a saint. I'm saying, like, what is the culture of, of safety that we have created where, where, where our sisters feel like my Muslim brother has my back? You know what I'm saying? My so Muslim your major brother, issue you know, with this is that he's behaving irresponsibly by doing this. And it's not a character of a Muslim. It's, male. it's, not, it's not only I, I attach the culture. I attach the individual action to the context, to the generation of culture that we're generating culture online, which has real world impact. Let's not okay. think that it's only online. This stuff has real world impact. It shapes and impacts people. The Arab Spring was what was in part motivated by what took place online. You know, so so the, the thing is not the thing is that we have to see ourselves in light of each other. We also have to see that communities don't work against communities in the process of what they're of their what they're trying to achieve. The, the Quran told us that you know Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala created us into Shu'ub. And Kabail for the you know to and to peoples and tribal configurations so we can come to know one another, come to know what's going on. Don't just your experience of the Latino community in that regard is just that. Wow, y'all got fine women. You know, fine women, mashallah. You know, I'm gonna have to pick up a second chick. You know, that's you know, what about one of the brothers, he was a Latino, he supported that. And I'm telling him, like, look, you may find that to be okay, but I don't find that to be representative of my grandmother's coach. That's 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 representative of hood culture is representative of club culture is representative of drug culture, but it's not representative of the best of our culture. And that's what that's what Hazel was bringing up. 
Hazel was bringing up the thing is that people don't understand that there's certain there's certain concepts and principles that Latinos have in their culture that don't have to be eliminated from Islam. That's not acceptable in our culture. You know, just like the sisters that are, you know, that basically are playing, you know, the whole angle of of, of playing into the sex object thing, that too is not from our culture. That's an Univision culture, which we don't own Univision. We don't which own Univision. What, we don't own the media. You know what exactly, I'm saying? Which, we don't. And which is, and, which is important uh, to, to, no, which is important to, to, to realize that when there are these preferences, where are these preferences coming from? Is it like Sheikh Yusuf said, that there is actually interaction with the community? Or is it just very much what is seen in the media and that's where the preferences are stemming from? And that's a really important question to have. Um, more, you had mentioned how like in, in the Desi community, in the Indopak community, that it's looked down upon for the most part to, to marry somebody who's African-American. Why is that? You know, is it's the anti-blackness, it's the fair and lovely culture, right? It's the wanting to blanquear la raza, to make your, the skin lighter. So we really need to be cognizant of where these preferences are coming from. Is it... Yeah, but, uh, but, but Hazel, Hazel, that's actually, yeah. that's in every culture, though. I mean, if you go from China to Malaysia to India and, and Africa, they're all using the skin lightening Solution. Everyone, there's, a, there's, a, um, it seems right. like it's like and, a built-in that, mechanism that, in our right in, in our minds that you yeah, know there's right like about that, yeah. but that's global. That's global white supremacy. That's yep. the thing is that the Muslims we have to be conscious of where we are in this whole reality of the global system, and culturally and what's going on. So it's like if the Quran is telling us that Allah created us into peoples and in, in tribal configurations, so we come to know one another, and we know that the children of Adam come come in different skin tones and complexions. And we know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's khutbah al or the last sermon talked about dignity and equality and dignity and, and the issues of what how you know what our scheme of valuation is when the Muslim community is internalizing jahiliyyah right on the on, as far as how we look at each other. Whether you're dark skin, whether you're olive skin, whether you're whether you're a light skin or whatever, we're supposed to have a configuration of beauty that allows us to celebrate the dignity of humanity. But what we have done, rather than bring the liberation of the Quran, what we're doing is we're regenerating the same caste system that all of us are running from, whether it's the Aryan caste system that was created in India, or whether it's the caste system that was in Egypt, or the caste system that the Spanish tried to take into uh, Latin America, or the caste system that we have in the U.S. Where is Islam? It, so, as far as if that's that becomes another issue, is another another set of another set of discussion. But Hazel is bringing up an important point: our level of consciousness about ourselves and identity and human dignity it's very low. And so, if we're the if we're ummah nas, where's our standard at? Right? Where's the standard at? If we're the best of people that is supposed to model for humanity, what 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 is the message of Islam? The, ex the experience of American Islam is not what we have being generated in the general culture. Malcolm X goes, he has an epiphany at the universality of human brotherhood, something which really wasn't an actualization 100% among the Muslims. But Allah allowed that to be his experience. And so you have to understand that the, uh, that the Muslim community here, part of it has that encounter with Islam. And that's reviving part of the Sunnah. Which right now, like you said, everyone is engaging in this skin bleaching and self-hating and self-deprecating and this and that. Well, that's not the experience of Islam in the American community, right? The Muslims may be practicing something different, but the experience of Islam in the American community is that Islam is supposed to be liberating us from this stuff. Islam is, and that doesn't mean that we all have to be the same and, and now we just all intermarry. No, it doesn't have, we can all celebrate our differences. We can, inter, I would love we have a lot of Latina sisters. I would love to have confidence in my Muslim brothers to, to tell a Latina sister, you know, okay, uh, you're looking for a husband. There's not enough Latino brothers, Latino brothers for the sisters. It's a reality. But I would love that we have the type of relationships that we as a community can say to brothers, we entrust you with one of our sisters. Let's build with each other. So so why is this but, happening? But, why is this happening to Latina sisters? Or, or why do you guys think Latina sisters are more susceptible or... Why are they falling victim to these sort of situations? Do, is there? Do y'all know about that? Why is why is this the, happening? The, the, that are happening. There's like a few people... few concepts that are there. Few concepts that are there. 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Chief. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Go yeah, ahead. The, the, you know, one of the things is this, that, yes, we, we still, there's a, there's another set of discussions that need to be had uh, uh, had about European-American sisters, African-American sisters. But one of the problems that we see amongst the Latino sisters that's very specific, and I tried to bring this out before, and Hazel, uh, I'm, not, I'm not silencing you, so whenever, you know, you want to jump in, one of the issues that we confront is that Latino sisters come in and there's no Wakil Wali system because they're coming into Islam as converts. They don't, the Wali system or the guardianship system, which usually comes from the family of Muslims, right, is there for the born Muslim. The African Americans, some of them have it. Many, many have, many don't. The European American sisters is another dilemma. Again, but you, I don't want to confuse the situations. I'm specifying the Latino sisters situation. They're coming into Islam and many of them have an ideal perspective, not all of them, of what Islam is bringing, like all of us converts. And so they're coming in without the necessary supports. And so this makes them susceptible that they don't have the necessary supports that are in place. So we as a community have to stand as a support system for them. Then we're able to correct other, whether it's the European American sister, African American, whether it's this, the Daisy sister or the Palestinian sister, whatever. But we're not talking universally right now. We're talking specifically about this case. This is the problem that uh, majority of the converts, majority of the converts coming into Islam from the Latino community, from the Latino community are women. And so you don't have the structures not in place to deal with the issues. That's what we're putting into place. The Latino community is in dialogue about putting into place these necessary practices and structures, and and and, we're, and this is why we're addressing this issue, because the, because there is a vulnerability, and there exactly. is a, a there is a side conversation that takes place amongst Muslims, whether it's imams or whether it's brothers. There's a side conversation that takes place, where you can marry these sisters for visa, you can marry these sisters for this, you can do this. These side conversations take place amongst brothers. I can tell and, you, and it ends up creating a culture which is problematic. No, I will, and, go ahead, Hazel. No, and it's also this notion, um, in addition to the the having a wadli and the wakil system, it's the zeal that when we convert as as Latinas, we immediately trust the Muslim community, right? Because we right. are putting everybody on this standard, right? Like everyone is like is following the sunnah. Everybody can be trusted. And so when our family members try to get involved and are are maybe giving warnings as converts we're like well you don't really know the community right like that's usually the response like you know you don't know the community very well so um you may not know what's going on and so there are walis and wakils that take advantage of the vulnerability of latina muslim sisters we are the largest population that is converting to islam so you have all these women and Many of them are single mothers. Many of them are teenagers, you know, from really all walks of life. And so not having a proper support system and not having good Muslim men to be the wakil and the walis while at the same time not trying, right. to, not trying to scope you out to be second wife, third wife, fourth wife. Right. It's, it's, right. Very, uh, it's very unnerving. It's very unnerving. So, I th- so I think- hey, hey, Hazel, I wanted to ask you, in your town, you're in Detroit. Does, do Latinos there have any relationship at the leadership level with Arabs and Daisies where you can talk about some of these problems and issues and deal with them? So in Detroit, there are not too many Latino Muslims, unfortunately. Um, I'm originally from Chicago, and in Chicago, there are, um, mashallah, there's a huge Muslim, uh, Latino but in Muslim Ch- population. But in Chicago, at the, because some of the stuff you mentioned, no doubt these are problems. In Chicago, at the leadership level, are there Latino leaders dealing with Muslim, le- uh, Desi leaders dealing with Arab leaders in the Muslim level? You have Ohala Foundation. Uh, you have Ohala Foundation right now in Chicago, and they they're trying to uh, and and it, it, it consists of Chicago. Uh, Hazel is better to talk about that, but Chicago has one of the oldest functioning Latino Muslim community, as well as New York. You know, but Chicago, the sisters have been there for quite a long time. But they have Ohala Foundation has, you know, is trying to take up that role along with sisters who are part of Mass and other communities. But this dialogue 
it, you know, I appreciate that you brothers brought it to the table because it needs to be had at, at a community level. Then we can move on to other systems as well. This, well it has to continue in different uh, scopes. Well, but, you know, the, 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 what, what happens right now, what happens with the, with the Daisy and the Arab community at this point in time, not all, but the Daisy and the Arab community have an internal competition over who is, will lead the community. And these issues are not seen as, as really relevant, let's be honest. Because part of the issue is that you have some of the imams from those communities are justifying these practices. And, they, and, and when the sisters go to them, they don't intervene. In 2008, as per Imam Wesley Lebron, uh, Sheikh Jamil from the Chicago community. You know Sheikh Jamil, right? Yes. Yeah. He, said, he, told, he told Imam Wesley Lebron, we had this conversation earlier. He said, tell your sisters don't marry our people. Because our people are in the process of using them. That's, that's not a Latino imam. That's not a Latina sister. That's not someone who got offended because of a comment. That is an imam in the community who is warning the Latino community in specific with regard to Latino sisters as to what is going on. That's in Chicago by itself, 2008. Without a doubt. No, and, so and, I get it. So, you know, Sam, I wanted to say one thing. Totally get I I appreciate uh, Chig Rios and uh, Hazel giving us these perspectives because I've I, honestly I've heard new perspective that I didn't have. But I wanted to say something. I'm joining you guys from my home here in Bogota, Colombia. That's where I live. And uh, my hometown is Houston, Texas. And I wanted to share, I, I don't, everything Hazel said and Chig Rios said has to be amplified. But my hometown is Houston. And I wanted to share one thought. Uh, born and raised there, 39. Um, and over there, we we have some of these problems. You, I'm sure these problems exist in Houston, but I wanted to share that there, uh, even though I live in Colombia, I still work uh, online with some of the groups there. We, we have a center there recently. Uh, it's an Assam and Spanish center raised, uh, I think, a little over a million dollars. And I'm not saying these points to downplay the problems that Hazel has mentioned, but I wanted to say one thing. There we have uh, Abdullah uh, Daniel Hernandez. We have Brother Isa Parada. We have, of course, Brother Mujahid Fletcher and his wife, Sakina. Mm -hmm. Those guys, I, I do want to share a couple things here. I want to get feedback from Hazel and Sheikh uh, Rios. The, they, not that they have to be accepted by Arabs or Daisies. You don't have to be accepted. But it's all about pleading Allah SWT. But they really, from the time, uh, came into Islam. And I've known Isa back since 97. I've known Mujahid. They came in and really built alliances when they when they take a project, when they built something. Recently, they raised a million dollars for the institute, for their new center. If something like this was happening in Houston, and I'm sure it is, people may be treating Latina sisters bad. All of us could get on the phone, the Arab brothers, the Daisy, those of us who are imams or leaders or committee heads. And we could be like, hey, man, this is horrible. This happened to a sister from Honduras. This happened to a sister from Puerto Rico. This happened to a sister from Ecuador. We could talk about it. The other thing I wanted to say is if you go to the uh, the center, it's my home masjid. When, I live, when I'm in Houston, me and my wife, we, we live by the center. You see the halakha. One of the teachers is an East Asian brother from Medina. You will see a black brother leading the mm -hmm. prayer. You will see. Um, so I wanted to say one thing. Um, I, I do feel as a child of Daisies, I know that the Daisy community by and large disrespected and abused the black community. That's 40 years. They did not appreciate them. When we talk about the history of Islam in America, we, we make it seem like it started with Daisies. We don't, I get all that. I personally feel what I've seen in Texas is that Latinos generally are getting a better shake, unfortunately, than the black. There, there really seems to be a lot of love. And I will tell you that for me, if I needed a khatib for our biggest masjid in Houston, I'm calling Abdullah Daniel Hernandez, I'm calling Isa Parada, I'm calling Mujahid. And the sisters there, uh, the Latina sisters there, tremendous respect. And to the point, I will tell you, Sheikh Rios and Sister Hazel, I have been blessed with my wife and kids to travel all over. We've been down to Chile, to Argentina. I always tell people, when I think of the Hadith, the best of them before Islam, or the be that's, I think about Latino people, the best of them before Islam or the best of them after Islam. Latino people are so, I mean, you'll find occasional ones that maybe aren't the best of people, but Latino people are family oriented. They're nice. They're respectful. They're devoutly Catholic down here, even, even today, but they, they love God. They love religion. And um, I, I think it's horrible. The things that Hazel has shared and you shared Sheikh Rios, but I wanted to, off, not because Houston is my hometown. I'm sure Houston has problems. I wanted to share 
Islam and Spanish as a model, where again, I think if you look at the people that Sheikh Isa and Sheikh Hernandez and Sheikh uh, or Brother Mujahid have around them, they have Daisies around them, they have Arabs around them, they have Latinos around them, they have the black community. And so they kind of have a really, uh, they built it. That's why I was asking about it. And Chicago sounds like it's the same, but there's really uh, any night, if you went on a Thursday night to the Islam and Spanish Center, you'd probably see 17 different nationalities and races and everybody. I don't mean to make it sound like it's utopia and everyone's perfect. I'm sure there's issues. But uh, I did want to kind of offer something positive because part of the discussion, I, I'm learning from y'all, but part of it was making me sad too. When Hazel was talking about how people treated her family, that was making me angry because nobody should be talking to a sister that way or, or definitely a family. Uh, the comment someone made to her father, that person should have been punched. And I know Islam is against violence, but that was horrible. So um, I just wanted to mention a little bit about kind of what we've done in Houston. And I know, Sheikh Rios, you on the – uh, on the street scene and on the practical level have a lot of Never. experience for us to benefit. I'm going to hand it back Sim. I didn't want to go too long. Yeah. Uh, I, but I think the I, things, I think, I think that, I think that the Islam, the Islamic Spanish model, I'm familiar with those brothers. I was in, 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 in H town, uh, Abdullah, Danny and I have a long relationship. You know, actually we were together in Houston. We were together in Egypt, actually we Mashallah. lived together and so on and so forth. I think that, uh, I think one of the things that has happened over there is that, yes, they have found support, but also they have had to tone down addressing some of the abuses. And I'm glad that they found some support within the community. That's mashallah, right? But, you know, also, you know, uh, there's a necessity for allowing people to speak to the issues. If we start to speak to these issues, and this is what has happened to the African-American community, is that the support is cut. So there, there is, there is a, a, a semi-silencing of issues in, in order to be able to get a certain level of support, right? And so I would say that I would, what, I expect to them, what I expect of them, if they're going to be the model like you put forward, is I expect for them to take up the banner. I expect for you to get on the line, talk to Mujahid Fletcher, say, Mujahid Fletcher, Isa Parada, why aren't you guys addressing these issues in the, in the Latino community? And we have them going on. You guys have a center. <laughs> You raise about a million dollars. You can hire people to be able to deal with this issue directly. You can sit down with the ISGH leadership and uh, you can sit down with the ISGH leadership in, in, in Houston. You can sit with the organization and try to come up with some system. Right. Um, and um, that's what I expect from those brothers. If they have if the community, if the community uh, was willing to fund the project then what's needed on the ground is not just only a funding of building is, is needed uh, what we needed to address the issues. We can't say that we're, you know, uh, we're supportive. And then when we try to address the issues, what happens is that we, we pull from the mission. Right. Uh, and so, so th that's the, that, that was one of the reasons why they created an organization was to address these types of issues. I right? mean, so I hold the them to account. One of the beauties of the Centro Islamico is that it is very welcoming, right? So they, they fought, they, one of the issues that many converts have is that entering a mosque and not feeling welcomed and completely being ostracized. So the fact that you're in Houston, predominantly Latino city, and there's a masjid that offers khutbas or halaqas in, in Spanish is absolutely phenomenal. But first and foremost, I have to give a shout out to the African-American community. I mean, Islam in America is on the backs of black Muslims. And one thing that I have said many times in various speeches is us as Muslims, as, as Latino Muslims, as Desi Muslims, as Arab Muslims, like we have to thank the Black Muslim community for everything that has been done when it comes to- support them, support and, them materially. And, and in, institution building that yep. we are able to, to be where we are today, right? And so there's a lot of issues as to probably why some black Muslim institutions are not able to rise to the level of some Desi and Arab institution. And it's, you know, mainly financial, right? Like, let's be real. Um, and so I just, let's, I, let's pause on that for a second since we're yeah. in the issue of justice, right? The issue becomes that the Zakat money and the fundraising opportunities are not opened up to trustworthy organizations. And so when we talk about, even, even when we talk about Imam Qasim Khan's, project in, uh, in the fifth ward in texas he had to go to kuwait to get money to build that masjid so that he could operate in the fifth ward in texas because he couldn't find the material support in texas itself and so he is doing grassroots work in the fifth ward 
with the African American community, but he wasn't able to find the support. It just so happens that uh, Mujahid Fletcher and them found some support. But shout out also to Imam Wesley LeBron from New Jersey who gave up building community in New Jersey to support Texas for their building up. So there's an Imam Daniel, the same thing. The thing about it is that the larger this, I'm sorry to, uh, to, to, to take the, the mic from you, Hazel, but the larger thing is that how we're utilizing funds, whether it's a camp money or, or sadaqa money or fundraising opportunity when it comes to building the community. Again, it comes back to the issue of, of rights and responsibilities, whether in language and behavior or resources overall. Yeah, I, I just want to add two two points to this final thing. My final thoughts on this. So this conversation is great, and and I'm glad we had this so we can understand what what was going on through your minds when you know both of your minds when when these comments were released. But in light of the, the discussion we're having right now, there's two things I just want to make, and I, and I tell this to even my own community and other people's. We have to be very careful um, in, in not falling too much under the victimhood mentality. We have to recognize the difference between our own errors and what other people are doing. Sometimes I've seen, unfortunately, even among the Arab community, they're quick to blame other people for stuff that they do them to themselves. And I don't want to fall in, in, into the path of saying, you know, or, or into that downward spiral of just pointing fingers. If you're wanting other people to, you know, do good as well too, we have to look at our own community and say, hey, what can we be doing better as well too so that we can raise ourselves up at the end of the day. That's the first point. The second point is with regards to the communities, like for example, the African-American community and, and the Desi or Arab community and why there's not so much cohesiveness. I think part of that problem is, and to be fair in, in the spirit of honesty, is that when the first generation came here, they didn't speak the language. They didn't know the culture. They come from very you know, uh, monolithic cultures. You know, they come from an Arab culture where it's all Arab people. They come from in India, Pakistan, it's all Daisy Brown people, right? Or wherever they came from. And I think their first priority was when they came here was, hey, we just need a place we can pray. They didn't think about if you were like Sunni or, or, or you know, if there, if there was Salafi or Diobandi, or, they didn't care. They just said, hey, we want to get a place to play, uh, pray for our own culture where, you know, we understand the language, we have khutbahs in our language. And they kind of did that unintentionally. And they were very introverted. Like they, if you notice, some of the, you know, Sister Hazel live in Chicago. The, most of the Muslim massages in Chicago never reached out to uh, the non-Muslim community at all. They were very closed in for a long time. Until 9-11 happened, nobody ever said, hey, we're a Muslim community. Come have an open masjid day. Come see us. Come talk to us. We just wanted to make money, keep our heads down, and then have a masjid open for us to pray. The community was literally, I mean, the masjid was just there to pray Juma and have the five prayers. There was really no other activity. And I think that was part of the old mindset that, hey, look, we're here to have a better life. We just want to go to school, send our kids to school, make money, be secure. And I think now our generation is. But that's place. not. But wait, but I'll just, let me finish things, here. What, what? I, I just want to finish this one point. I think our generation is in the point now where we have the luxury of saying, hey, look, we need to have a better environment. We need to have more social outreach. We need to see ourselves as a, as a community because we don't see ourselves as back home, right? We see ourselves as American Muslims, right? That we see, hey, when, when I see, a, a, you know, a black Muslim or a Latino Muslim or an Arab Muslim or whatever it is, they go through the same backlash that we all go through, right? I mean, in general, like, you know, the media looks at us all as the same. They lump us together. No matter what your ethnic background is, they're going to say, hey, that's a Muslim. So now, they, especially in a post 9-11 world, so I think for us, it's more, it's, th that burden falls, I think, more upon us now. Is what I'm trying to say. The, the immigrant generation, they didn't really get these concepts. We are aware of it now. And if we don't take the torch on that, we only have ourselves to blame. If you can get my point. I, I don't understand where the victimization thing came in at here, but uh, I don't understand what that applies oh, well, to. Well, but... I, I'll, I'll, I'll just clarify. I'm not saying anything in this particular conversation, but sometimes I'll give an example. Like we'll say, you know what? Oh, if uh, and I'll give an example of my own community. Oh, you know what? If my uh, the Arab community or the Desi community reached out to African Americans, you know, um, you know, they would have had a, a better thing. And and I'm just gonna blame everything on the old generation. I can't do that. It's it's for me. I'm not gonna put that blame on them. I'm gonna say, what am I doing now for it? I mean, that's the past is the past. I can't just rely and say we're never going to fix things yeah, because they yeah, did but that. You, right. We, that's why I said that's why I said here we're drawing the line because we are taking up for ourselves in this situation with is specific with leadership in the Latino community. 
And you see that there's leadership on both sides, males and females. But that's not completely a historical, historically accurate picture. When the Muslims came here from the beginning of the Dawah, they came in and many organizations, many of the immigrant communities uh, were, were aligned with the African-American community. We are not all the same. This is not a correct understanding. We're not all the same. Uh, people came in on certain levels of visas. And when they came in on certain visas, for, first of all, we have to understand that the civil rights movement, which was predominantly black and Latinos struggling for human civil rights, is what changed visa policy. So the African-American community opened up the door for, and everybody who was in that struggle with them opened up the door for the for Muslims to come in. That's one thing. The second thing is that the uh, economic opportunities that the Muslims availed themselves of, that in part came from engaging, decided where you want to be on the system, in the system, which I don't, I don't knock anybody for that. I don't knock anybody for taking certain choices, right? But we have to understand the historical reality. The historical reality is that the Muslim community opted for, uh, for going into the middle class, upper class, white society, and they opted not to build infrastructure for the whole of the community. And that's historical fact. There was initially, there was initially an alignment between the groups, and you, and and, and the, all the things are documented. So at a certain point, the immigrant community opted, we want to be part of white society, and it stayed quiet for a long time. So then now we talk about we're all the same because it's impacting the Muslim community, but it, in general, but we're not we're not the same when it comes to the issue of social justice. If we're all the same, then the money that we send to Palestine or Kashmir or whatever should also be going to the community here. That's, that shows that we're all the same, that we're concerned with the causes of the people that are here as well. But, we, you know, we can't pretend the false brotherhood when the action is not there. And it's not an issue of blaming. It's an issue, issue of fact. You know, the, 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 the social justice issue, whether it was a Muhammad Ali or Malcolm X or whether it was grassroots movements, whether it was core a lot of movements, they paved the way for the general Muslim community. The Muslim community has yet to give back. So you got to realize there's a big difference. The Muslim community outside of the indigenous, you didn't fight for civil rights. You didn't struggle for civil rights. You didn't bang with the system for civil rights. You, 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 you didn't go to jail for civil rights. You didn't get bit by dogs for civil rights. You didn't. You, you, you took the benefit of that, right? That was the, that's where the benefit was taken and there was nothing given back. This is the same issue that the... Look, you got to realize, Islam came into the inner city and it cleaned it up, whether it was Saraj Wahaj in Brooklyn or other communities all across the country. You got to realize the position that the Muslims took as a middleman minority. This is where the frustration comes in at. People got rich. They drive around in their escalates. They got rich off of the hood, off of selling black and miles and alcohol and this and that. And it undermined the dawah effort that was taking place in the hood. The, the professional class opted not to deal with anyone else. And they opted to just go the route of, let me take care of myself and my family. So we have a middle class neoliberal cultural Islam that has been generated in the Muslim community. And we only operate from crisis. Every time the, when the Muslims realize, oh, we're not going to go back home. Now we have to build a masjid. Oh, our children are messed up. Now we have to build the school. There's no, there's no reasoning, no forethought of what community looks like. That's what, sure, we have the obligation now, but we can't get that history wrong because if we get that history wrong, we won't be able to align ourselves properly. And that's yeah, but you, Sheikh, I just wanted to add one thing. I mean, for, speaking from my own, own upbringing and what I've seen, I remember being in Chicago, we had one masjid, which was MCC downtown Chicago. That was the inner city masjid at that time. That was before Islamic Foundation opened up, which at one point was the largest, I think, land square mosque. Like, I mean, land, you know, square footage, uh, square feet in the entire nation at one point. That didn't open until, and I think what happened, I don't think it's fair to say that, oh, they just abandoned the inner city um, and, and, and opened the masjid out there. What happened is most of these people that came, especially from these immigrant populations, I know from, my, from the community that I grew up in, a lot of them were professionals when they came from overseas. And so they got jobs naturally in the suburb area. They got jobs in, in hospitals and firms that worked out in, in the suburbs. And that's where they built their community. They had no problem going to, to MCC. But after a while, you know, when you have, you know, a, a message in the community center as well, too. And they're not going to drive 35, 45 minutes into the city every, every time, especially in some areas where they were 
more dangerous. Yeah, but that, right? that's understandable. But that's understandable. But what went what went back here? That here the Islamic Center opted to go to a white supremacist environment. Well, After, yeah. If prior that's the case, to that, they, they all they all they all they all lived in the inner city. You know, I don't know what Hazel was going to say, but I was going to say, at what percentage do we keep saying, let's be fair? The issue is where is rights and responsibilities at? On, on everybody's side at this point, right? That's where we can be fair. Where's the rights and responsibilities that all we all have to build community? And I actually wanted to mention a point. The first MCC was right on North Avenue in Kedzie, right across the street from Humble Park. Humble Park is a predominantly Puerto Rican community where I'm from in Chicago. And that was the first masjid. When I first found out, I asked my family, did you guys know that there was a mosque here? And they were like, nope. There was, you know, very similar to what Mort mentioned, right? Like very insular, trying to keep on um, holding on to religion and culture. I totally get that. Um, but this is why places like Centro Islamico draws so many different kinds of people because they get it. A lot of people are the converts. The, the leadership of Centro Islamico are converts. They understand the convert experience. Recommitted Muslims in the second, third generations of Desis, Arabs, you know, Eastern Europeans, they feel welcome within this space because they feel heard and they feel understood having been here. And so, you know, there's, a, there's very different conversations happening, but really to go back to the main point, the fact that our communities, our ethnic communities, the fact that our ethnic communities are not getting to know one another and be among one another and get right. to know one another, as Allah says in the Quran, the fact that this is not happening is why there's stereotypes and is why there's anti-blackness and why there is, you know, sexualizing Latina women, right? Because what the interaction is with the people is what's on TV and media and not necessarily among one another. All right, guys. Uh, yeah, we, we got to wrap this baby up. I know Sheikh Rios and, and uh, Hazel have to go. I know there's 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 just so much more to be discussed. And, and Hazel, thank you so much for joining us. I know there's what gets lost in a lot of conversations is that uh, I know I know just personally, just from talking to a lot of others, there's um, it seems like there's a, a culture of uh, just walking on eggshells online, and it seems like everyone's getting offended about something, and that's what. I hear all the time from a lot of brothers and they're just like, you know what? They're just going underground and they're just going to their WhatsApp groups and, and then, and, and the problem is festering. And I think this is one of an important medium for us to just have an open conversation so that we can better understand each other. So, so that a lot of this stuff, right. I mean, the whole call out culture and everything, you know, uh, um, yeah, there, there is a benefit I'm sure to that, but, uh, but in terms of discussing some of the nuances behind that and, and, really getting to know each other i think there's a, there's a much more uh, a bigger benefit in platforms such as these and i hope uh you guys continue to visit us and and uh well, tell... well but there's an issue there yeah. too I, I i don't want to extend the conversation yeah. further there's the issue that we have a concept in islam of enjoying the good and forbidding the evil we have a concept of drawing lines on certain things but i think that i think that i think we can't just say every you know some things we gotta say no you're doing wrong Right. Uh, and then and then but I think something that's very important that was mentioned and I think everyone is hitting on that is what is our vision of community? That's what I, this is what the point that is constantly emphasized. I've been emphasizing from my side rights and responsibilities to each other. You know, uh, you know, what's our vision of community? Like, where do we want to go? Yeah. You know, uh, and this, it's, this, a, it's this, an important this, question this, because question. for I know Hazel and Mort know that Chicago is a very segregated um, uh, area. I mean, forget about Islam in general. All the ethnicities are are, are very segregated throughout uh, throughout the city and the suburbs as well. So it's it's something that's not just a a religious challenge, but uh, it's also a societal yes. challenge for for everyone in in, in the world. But uh, so so are we going to imitate? Are we going to imitate the situation as is, or are we going to bring something to the table? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That and and that that that's a that's the discussion that we're going to have to uh, at least bring up to our our leaders in our community. You know, if we can't have it among ourselves, at least um, start bringing some of these issues to our leaders who who are our representatives, right? Essentially, they're the only people who can actually uh, make a change, and they have to know that there there are people who want this change. That that they that that we need more outreach, not just. 
among the churches and the synagogues, but also among our fellow Muslims of different ethnicities so that we can better learn uh, from one another. And, and But you're part of the leadership, too. Like, you know, you're creating culture with the mad mamelukes. Yes. And, and like, you know, like you said, like, we have to be, like it was said here, we have to be empowered. Like, the thing is, like, that's why we can't cover everything in this one session, but I would like to hear what you what you all think community should look like. Yeah. You know, as being first generation Muslims, like where should we be going as a community? Like what are the priorities? Again, I'm not expecting the answer right now. Yeah. But a dialogue at least. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, inshallah, yeah. uh, we'll schedule another follow up conversation with you and, and hopefully Hazel could even as well join us as well. And uh, we'll look forward to that. Um, yeah, it could, it could even possibly be a, a series because it's not just a one episode topic, right? There's so many different elements of a community. It's hard to fit that in, condense that into an hour or an hour and a half, right? There's so many different variables that make up a community, especially one as diverse as our own. It's just almost impossible to do it in, within an hour. Yeah, right. I agree. I, I just wanted to thank you all for um, inviting me on this very important topic and all the conversations that were had and we branched off in a lot of different areas, but I'm very grateful that this was a conversation that we had. I yeah. mean, I never thought I'd be on a podcast talking about Latino Muslim issues. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and for well, yeah. the listeners out there, if you guys disagree with what we've talked about, you know, uh, um, ask away in, in the comments below and, and let us know. And always, <laughs> right. you know, uh, we're here to help you understand things better and, and grow from one another. As long as you, you ask in respectful ways, you know, screaming and yelling and, um, you know, using abusive language will, will get you banned in the comments. But if, if you have any other type of questions, uh, everyone on this panel will, will be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Let's give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Halfardeen.com is a place you go for your private marital experience. Um, I'm scared uh, talking about marriage now <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, why the com is the place you want to invest when you get some money and you want to earn some uh, uh, some of your investments back in, in a halal manner go to why com and finally my com for your sharia compliant will thank you so much for everyone for joining us help us out on patreon and we will see you all on um, Mad Mondays, uh, thank you, Hazel, Chef Rios, and for my co host, Mort and Ertiza. My name is Sim. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>